BCFM 93.2, your interactive station, 24 hours a day. So as the latest James Bond film, Spectre, hits the big screens, we take a deeper look now at serious wartime naval intelligence senior, wartime naval intelligence officer, 007 author Ian Fleming, where many now believe... Uh, his James Bond name originated a top secret mission in the closing days of World War II to snatch his Hitler's treasurer, Martin Bormann, from under the noses of the Russians, and with him, billions of dollars in looted gold and other valuables. But what happened to that money, anyway? A bit of revelation uh, to go along with the Bond film this week from Lawrence de Mello over in Argentina. And I started by asking her about her change from working here in Britain over to Argentina, why she went there. I made a lifestyle change and I came here in 2002. Previously to that, I was a um, fairly mainstream producer and journalist and working out of Pinewood Studios. So when I came here, I always had a great interest, when I say a healthy interest, in Nazis and where they went and the rat lines. So it was almost a natural progression that television networks here were not really what I was used to working with. I was used to dealing with high-end networks. So I started to sort of read a lot of material and slowly, slowly realized that there really was a very strong post-World War II Nazi community here and uh, that uh, high-ranking Nazis, which we know already came here, but Bormann had certainly been here in South America. So I followed that trail. Initially, I was looking to do a program called Children of Odessa and I was actually in contact and I actually still in contact with some grandchildren of name infamous Nazis that came here. But slowly, slowly, I realized that Borman was just such a big fish and he was so important to the whole situation that's gone on today in the European Union, etc. I mean, the one to follow was Borman. I mean, we've all done the children of, of, of Nazis and what's happened, but it just progressed on to following Martin Borman. When I bump into people and I have friends saying, oh, Lawrence is doing that while she's here, maybe I'll bump into some people from the UK that come over to Buenos Aires for whatever reason. And they'll say, oh, Lawrence is on the trail. She's investigating. They say, oh, who are you investigating? I say, oh, Martin Borman. You would be amazed, Tony, how many people do not even know who Martin Borman was. And I find that frightening in a way because he was such an important figure throughout World War II, particularly when we're talking about the appropriated funds from Jews and whatever, whoever that Germany stole from during World War II, gold, whether it be art, whatever, Martin Bormann was the one that managed all of that. I mean, he was a very ambitious, not particularly educated, very clever, and he slowly, slowly worked himself up so he became indispensable to Hitler. Hitler trusted him completely. Uh, he was a very clever man as far as keeping accounts and managing uh, banks, etc. So he was the man that had the reins, had the keys to those deposit accounts in 1945. There's quite a dispute, isn't there, in Europe and particularly in Germany about whether he actually survived the war. So what evidence have you found in South America that he did? At the end of 1945, when we were in such a terrible situation, the USA, Britain, the Western intelligence services utilised high-ranking former Nazi officials for their own means, etc. Why would they not go after the money man? It does not make sense. Mm. I mean, there's no way that they would not have found Martin Bormann. Now, Martin Bormann, when you say what evidence do we have, what evidence do we have that he's dead? That's how we really need to approach this. Because the owner should be on them to tell us that he certainly died. No, there was a body, there was a body, but the forensics of the body show that the body actually died much, much later than 1945. And whose testimony are we relying on? Two Russian soldiers. So when you say what evidence do we have, we should be asking, what evidence is there that Martin Bormann certainly died in 1945? Have you discovered any real evidence that he was in South America? Well, I've interviewed various people, which I would say are very reliable witnesses. One of them was Commissioner George Silvia Colotto, and he was the former chief of the federal police in Buenos Aires, pretty tough position. And he was the ADC to seven Argentine presidents, all the way from Farrell up to Onganea. And one of the presidents he was extremely close to was Domingo Perón and Evita, his wife, Eva. And it was during that time that he told me that he actually met Martin Bormann in Buenos Aires at the end of 1952 and was connected to him until sort of mid-1953, looking after his security here while he was in Buenos Aires. And also 
being the middleman to take bills to be paid personally by Juan Perón for Martin Borman's stay here in Buenos Aires. I absolutely believe this gentleman. He's written many, many books. He's been imprisoned. He was imprisoned. He was accused of being involved with the dictatorship, which, of course, there's always a witch hunt here. But a very, very well-read, qualified, experienced man, independently wealthy. Tony, no reason for him. He wasn't earning any money out of releasing this information. He asked me to help him with his diaries, which I did. And, of course, we built up a, a relationship, just as I did with John Ainsworth Davis. And the interesting thing is all the stories sort of fit together. Together, the stories I got from John Ainsworth Davis fit exactly with what George Colotta was saying. There's another man, Captain Monisterio, who I'm in touch with. He's still alive today. He also knows about Martin Borman, one of uh, his friends. So this is not just hearsay. I mean, of course, there have been detailed uh, security efforts to wipe away any evidence of that. But we have to trust people's testimony. I mean, people, people have been hung for testimony. So why is it that when people give a, a statement to say that Martin Bormann was certainly here, he lived at that address, I mean, come on, Mengele was here, Karl Wernet was here, Adolf Eichmann was here, Klaus Barbie was here. I mean, how many need to be here, but the money man's not here? Why do you think South America was such a magnet after World War II? I mean, you've talked about the children of Odessa. I mean, it does sound as if uh, this was a kind of network to help Nazis escape, and there was quite a bit of planning that went into it. But why South America? Well, actually, even before World War II, there were lots of Germans coming over to South America in the Southern Hemisphere. We're away from everything else. We're away from the Western intelligence services, etc. It's a completely independent, it's cowboy land, basically. And money rules, corruption is rife. So anybody that has a little bit of power and a bit of money can do basically what they want. It's an enormous country. You've got everything here. So Richter, Richter the scientist, came here. He was funded by Peron to come here and do his atomic experiments, etc., right down in the south of Argentina. I mean, that's factual. You can go there today and see the ruins. A, a colleague of mine has been there taking some amazing photographs and seen some amazing documents. That was in the 40s. He was here in the 50s. Richter was here. I have a colleague here, actually, who's done an enormous amount of research on that, which would probably be useful to you have an interview with him one day. So they were coming over here even before the end of World War II. They knew, but when things were getting tricky there, they already put into place a plan that this would be the perfect place to escape to. You wouldn't be found here. You could experiment here. You, you could be involved in weapons. And, of course, the Argentine government would pick up anybody that wanted to be involved with them because, you know, they were, they were sort of outcasts in a way. I mean, they wanted to feel like they were part of the Western world, but they never really have been, just as they're not today. They will pick up any dredges of anyone that wants to come in with a bit of brain power and a bit of money. Of course, they're going to go for it because they want to try and compete with the big boys. I think they're probably just whores in that. They probably buddy that would give them something they felt was going to further their feet on the international stage. I don't really believe it was about um, communists or anything like that. I mean, come on, Che Guevara was uh, Argentine. <laughs> Il Che... I mean, the people here in Argentina, they love chair. You still go around today. In fact, my son's got one. It was He was given a T-shirt with a big red T-shirt with Che Guevara on. So you have even the upper classes here who are all, always pro-Nazi that still think Che is a great hero. Well, who was Che? He was the biggest communist. That's what the CIA used Klaus Barbie to go in and try and get hold of to, to try and catch Che Guevara. So, you know, there are lots of contradictions. Certainly, I will put my hand in the fire. Martin Bormann was here connected to what's going on in the European Union today. That's another thing, Tony. People say, but this happened such a long time ago. This is not important. It's very, very important, this. It's very important. I mean, when you think what's going on, I mean, the European Union, we're controlled mm. by Germany today. We're controlled by Germany. Let's look at it this way. Make it simple. Martin Bormann was taken by British intelligence services out of Germany so they could get hold of the funds that were controlled by Nazi Germany. Mainly, most of those funds were in Switzerland, of course, and Switzerland was neutral. They took hold of those funds. I'm pretty sure what they used those funds for, they weren't going to hand the money over, over immediately. Martin wasn't going to do that. He was going to say, OK, I will drip feed some projects of yours. And when that project's done, and I have stood by the agreement that we have, you have to release me. And that is exactly what happened. 
I believe Martin Bourne was released at the end of 1952. Just work it out what was going on in 1952. He was released. He went to Brazil. He met up with the Mengele. We know Mengele was there at that time. And then Mengele then came to Argentina. He was given a license to practice as a doctor of medicine here, formally, with his name. And Martin Bormann also came to Argentina. I mean, you've painted a pretty strong picture there of this Martin Bormann, uh, who nobody seems to have heard of, even though he was one of the most powerful people at the end of the Second World War, certainly the richest. Obviously, he's doing deals for his safe passage. Some of that Nazi wealth is exchanged as part of those deals. But, he, you know, he's got literally tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds left over. Where, where did it go, do you think, at the end of the Second World War? This is one of those questions that's always left hanging in the air. I'll tell you where I believe it went. It went into the British Atomic Program. I'm absolutely convinced that is where the money went. And we need to ask the question, when the Atomic Program was revealed in British Parliament early in 1952, now let's just go back and analyse that. 1945, Britain was on her knees economically, economically and structurally. I mean, she was a mess. We were in debt because let's not forget this. Everybody thinks the Americans helped us. It wasn't. They were like they came in like mercenaries. Yeah, they came in to cover their ass after Pearl Harbor. We were on our knees within seven years of being absolutely minus 12. How did Britain manage to finance and develop an atomic weapon? And nobody asks that question. And I'll tell you how that was financed. That was where the money came from. Churchill went in, he got Borman, put it in a simple form. Okay, here's the deal. Like they did deals with Barbie and all the others. This is the deal with you, Borman. We want the Dutch. So you are going to finance the atomic program for us because we're not happy with the Americans. Aha. So Borman has drip fed that. That's why he was kept in Europe until I would say at least 1951. And when he finished his commitment with financing the atomic bomb, what happens? And also, let's notice something. Churchill took a step back. Churchill, he should have been the hero, shouldn't he, of World War II? Winston Churchill, my God, everybody loved him. He came out and made the most crazy statement, something about we need to do something like the Gestapo. I can't remember what the comment was. But basically, he sabotaged his chance of being elected now, I believe that was a deliberate ploy because he had to take a back seat because he was involved in the extraction of Martin Borman. And it's a question of sort of getting rid of the responsibility. He took a back seat. He was involved in the atomic program. And then what happens? In 1951, he comes back onto the front benches. And when he reveals in 1952... Early in the year, it's April or May, he tells the parliament, we've actually developed a bomb. Everybody was aghast. They didn't even know that we had an atomic program. Question, I'm going to have to find the quote for you, and you're going to have to read it one day, Tony. There's a quote, that actually it was used in, 90, in, in 2014 in parliament, and somebody actually reads out the comments that were made that day when Churchill revealed the atomic program in parliament in 1952. And the questions were asked by certain ministers like, wow, we've got the bomb. And they said, now let's over a hundred million pounds, 1951, 1952. It's a lot of money. I don't know what that is worth today. I'm not very, very good on, on, on economics. But anyway, so questions were asked in the House. It's actually on the record. Well, where did the money come from? And Churchill said words to the effect of, well, yes, yes, I know accounts weren't done, but let, basically... It's done now. Don't ask questions. We have the weapon. Let's move forward. In the future, we'll keep, we'll keep track. Where did the hundred million pounds come from? And in parallel to that, I want to say, why with all the forensic the control that there is, internet, whatever, they, they know everything that we're doing. We, they know what color underwear we've got on. Since 1945 to 2015, nobody has found those funds that were taken by Nazi Germany. Nobody has found which bank they're in, where they are, where the stocks, where the shares, where the bonds, where the gold. Occasionally, a painting will come out. But why has it never been found? Because it was found. It wasn't lost. It was taken by the British government. The Americans then were informed afterwards because the Americans were pissed off, basically, excuse my French, that the British were taking control. But we needed the bomb. 
We didn't want to be behind the Americans. We need the bomb. And that's where I believe that money was. The other was invested into companies, 750 companies, and that's which led to Europe today. But I think that's where we need to be looking. And I'm in my investigation at this point with other people looking at this, and I really do believe that's where the money went. And the timing, I didn't even think about the atomic. It came to me through certain sources here, paperwork and other things I've heard about Martin Borman, that the timing is exactly that. Martin Borman appears in South America just before Churchill announces the atomic bomb in Parliament. Now, I know people can say, well, this is all just conjecture. It's all just coincidental. Yeah, it's coincidental, but where's the money? Where did we get the bomb from? Lawrence DeMello there speaking to me this week from Buenos Aires um, and I wonder what you make of the uh, conjecture there Kevin because it's certainly you know if it's going to cost you 100 million pounds and you haven't got that 100 million pounds where did the money come to develop the British atomic weapons? I think it's the perfect question. <clears throat> the, the thing she didn't mention and nobody's ever understood is that when he became Prime Minister in 1951 Churchill for the first time in British history made himself the Defence Minister as well. He held both portfolios. And I, I mean, 100 million then is the equivalent of about 5 billion now. So it's, I mean, it's big. Yeah, so interesting. Um, Martin, I mean, the connection with the Bond films, uh, we know, but I think we should just make it a, pr a bit clearer, uh, is that the name James Bond came from this uh, Christopher Crichton book. Uh, his real name's John Ainsworth Davis, but he had to have a, a pen name because it was a factual book and he was afraid of being arrested under the Official Secrets Act, which talks about this uh, raid to snatch Borman in 1945, literally just days before the end of the Second World War. Uh, and Ian Fleming was involved too. Well, Ian Fleming was the line manager for John Ainsworth Davis who actually was infiltrated into Germany to e extract Borman, according to the book uh, Operation Op JB which uh, people need to look up and, 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 and research. One of the books we didn't mention there is, well, well, Lawrence mentioned the 750 corporations that Borman set up with whatever money he had remaining after he'd come over from uh, the atomic bomb project here uh, and uh, those 750 companies uh, were populated with Nazis who then taken off their swastikas, not just Nazis, but people who'd supported the Nazis, fascists from all parts of the world, actually, um, and put on suits and strolled into the boardroom. Well, the book was Paul Manning's book, uh, Martin Borman, Nazi in Exile, and Paul Manning, of course, was the top CBS journalist for the US throughout World War II, so he was very well connected. If people want to research these things, no doubt they can go to our webpage and find the relevant uh, links to uh, follow up the stories. That's that right. Well, I'll put we're, some we're, links we're up covering. on the webpage, which is thisweek.org.uk, and you can find uh, the Paul Manning book for free as a PDF on the Spitfire List, Dave Emery's uh, website. Time to sign, sign off now for the Murdoch News at 7. Our sister show Dialect, I'm afraid, isn't on anymore. I'll be bringing you news about that in the future. Thanks to our guest in the first hour, Labour Councillor for South Mead, Jenny Smith. Uh, thanks also to Kevin Carhill uh, and uh, Teo Aluko and to old Labour Oxford economist Martin Summers. Uh, you can find us online at thisweek.org Dot UK and I am on Twitter at Tony Gosling, wishing you a relaxing and enjoyable weekend. Do please join us on the politics show at five o'clock next week and don't let those banksters get you down.